I know a great game I can play today. The Kingdom Hearts 3 drinking game. Every time a character in the game says the word heart, light or darkness, take a shot. <laughs> Where's Goofy? Go Goofy and Jay are scrolling ass over here! Don't, don't! Don't, I swear to God, if you cast ice on that ice enemy, he did it! He did it! He, he froze the he blizzard the ice! Oh! oh. Mickey, watch out! It's a harmless old Save you! Oh. All right. Kingdom Hearts was a story about a lovely little sausage called Sora who had two friends named Riku and Kairi. <laughs> Riku got possessed by darkness, Kairi went missing, and Sora had to use a giant key along with the help of Donald Duck, Goofy, and a few Final Fantasy characters to stop the darkness in multiple Disney worlds in order to get to the end to save his friends. Then it got complicated. The first game was a roaring success for its action RPG cross hack and slash gameplay in a 3D space and had the added benefit of classic Disney nostalgia to win even the most heartless person over. <laughs> and so after the original in 2002, they made a sequel that wouldn't see a worldwide release until 2006. The story in 2 didn't follow off from 1 at all for some reason, but it didn't matter because everyone loved it even more than the first and that left fans wondering where on earth Kingdom Hearts 3 could be. And wouldn't you know, 13 years later it was finally released with absolutely no content or even hints of what was going on in the meantime. Took your sweet ass time, Square Enix. That whole paragraph there is what I'm sure a lot of people playing Kingdom Hearts 3 will probably be like, especially Xbox One people. They'll be looking at Kingdom Hearts as a trilogy. One, two, three, with this closing off all the events of these two games. With three specifically being the 13 year long wait conclusion to the previous games, which is just not the case at all. There were loads of other games in the series that had just as much time and effort put into them in the middle of all these releases. Once or twice in a game store, you probably saw in the corner of your eye a random Kingdom Hearts game that was released on maybe something like the PSP, or the Nintendo DS, or the Nintendo 3DS, or maybe even the Game Boy Advance, and you'd be right in assuming that these were just portable spin-offs, but you couldn't be further from the truth. These were as important and as integral to the main story as any of the other mainline Kingdom Hearts games, and they were releasing relatively frequently. In fact, the most recent chapter of the Kingdom Hearts story was actually only released in 2017. I'm fully aware there was no indication about that over the years, and the multiple systems they released the games on really didn't help, but give the director of the series Tetsuya Nomura his due. He realised how done this all was and so provided a simple and concise way of letting everybody catch up with every majorly important story game with these nifty PS4 collections, and they have been out for a long time before 3 ever came out, so at this point there's no excuse for people that complain about not knowing who characters are in 3. Kingdom Hearts 3 was not made for newcomers everybody, it's common knowledge that the series is confusing and it's now all here for you. It takes less than 5 minutes to look up the game order releases and chronology on the internet, and if you aren't happy about that or don't have the time to play the other games, might I recommend this incredible to the point and simple to follow 30 minute video that covers everything important in Kingdom Hearts between 2002 and 2017. And if you don't want to do any of that and still want to call the game out for not being appealing to newcomers, well then this just wasn't made for you, okay? Not every sequel has to appeal to every man, woman and child every time a new game comes out. Some series award their fans and this is just one of those series. Plus, as I've said before in my other Kingdom Hearts videos from the past, the subtitles of all the other games relate entirely to the way the games themselves play, because 1, 2 and 3 play in an almost identical identical way with more being added to what makes Kingdom Hearts so great to play with every iteration. Calling Chain of Memories for instance Kingdom Hearts 2 would have implied that this was the direction the series was taking and I think that would have put people off from ever touching the series again if they weren't a fan of it so I do understand what they were doing but the multiple systems they were releasing on that's when it starts getting ridiculous I mean there was even a mobile one a MOBILE ONE! Regardless speaking as somebody who only recently marathoned every Kingdom Hearts game right before the release of 3 Wow, what a damn ride it's been. This game essentially caps off events of a story that has been bobbing and weaving around for over 17 years now. And when the first trailers dropped for Kingdom Hearts 3, the hype was so real that even the most diehard fans couldn't form coherent sentences about how much of a big deal this was. Hello? Caddy, are you playing Kingdom Hearts 3? Yes. Ah!
This doesn't mean this is the end of Kingdom Hearts though, because I just view Kingdom Hearts 3 as another chapter of a grander story. So do I think there's going to be stuff in the future? Absolutely. I don't think this is like the grand epic finale everyone was expecting, I guess, but I never saw it like that to begin with. In case you were wondering as well, in this video there are going to be gameplay spoilers, but only gameplay spoilers, characters, boss spoilers and that kind of stuff. But as far as story events go and the endings and the secrets, none of that is going to be touched. So if you're freaking out about that and you still want to watch this video, you can. There's going to be none of that. And with that, let's dive into Kingdom Hearts 3. Oh, sorry, my mistake. I mean Kingdom Hearts 2.9 and then 3. I am done with your bullshit! So hey, without spoiling anything, what is the gist of the story here? Hello, darkness, my old darkness. Well, I mean, it's definitely a story full of... We can infiltrate from a window inside babies and toddlers. Caddy, please come back inside the house. I can't. I, ha I have to lock the keyhole. I mean, what more can I say? It's Disney, it's the classic Sora, Donald and Goofy gang back together, it's nostalgic yet fresh, and across all the other games I have slowly become an unapologetic fan of all the ridiculous, batshit insane nonsense that happens in Kingdom Hearts plots, with this game not disappointing at all in that regard. Even the game's own characters don't know what's going on in the first five minutes. You know the Lost Masters. Who? But I don't mind any of that, because once you just accept the absurdity and consider everything the other games have built up to, I still found the story of 3 remarkably enjoyable, especially towards the ending. You said that you've battled those intruders before. Tell us where and why. Buzz, you're asking a very complicated question there. I'm confused. Hmm? That guy in the black coat. Would he trust me? Don't go there! And as expected, it isn't without its issues and totally stupid parts unrelated to the actual story. You can count on us to take care of Sora! I would have it no other way. I put Sora in your hands. Yen said, for such an old, wise wizard that's been in nearly every single game so far, you're the biggest prick in the whole series. The thing is though, Kingdom Hearts 3 is in essence the Metal Gear Solid 4 of the franchise. It's not been made with any attempt to fill brand new players in on what's going on, which I don't personally mind because of what I said earlier. I think continuing stories are allowed to exist over years upon years of games, but that means you have to expect every possible level of fan service, good guy and bad guy from past games returning for one last bout, and every single element culminating into a grand spectacle so it's able to finalise the Xehanort saga. The guy who has basically been the secret bad guy from the very beginning beginning of Kingdom Hearts. It is just a bit of a shame though that to me, even as a Kingdom Hearts fan, the actual plot felt a bit too much like a bookend until you get to the final hours. The final pieces of the jigsaw are being placed, as it were, for most of the game, and that's kind of it really. Riku and Mickey are spending most of the time looking for Aqua in the Realm of Darkness so they can save her and find out where she hid Ventus, Axel or Lee and Kairi are off training with their new Keyblades, and Sora has the job of just regaining his strength he lost from Dream Drop Distance, and to do so must follow his heart towards all of the different Disney worlds that he feels may need need his help, and if he's lucky, maybe he'll bump into Terra in order to bring him aside and break Xehanort's control from him. Until the final portions of the game, that's kind of all that's going on here. There isn't much development or a cohesive drive to Sora and the player's quest, and more like a weirdly paced long crescendo to the final battle to stop Xehanort's scheme of controlling Kingdom Hearts itself and basically destroying everything. But what made me look at this a little differently is by judging it not as a big old standalone epic final final my name's Lido game, and more as just an additional chapter to a much bigger story. Kingdom Hearts 3 at its core is a smaller chunk of one massive game. And I suspect it really helps out that I marathoned every other game right before playing it because if I had jumped into this after years of no Kingdom Hearts engagement or hell, even after Kingdom Hearts 2 or God forbid even as my first game, I would have most probably just given up with everything. Kingdom Hearts 3 does not give a single spindly Johnny about you unless you're fully aware of everything that it's been building up to. As a self-contained adventure, it's kind of weak and not that engaging at all unless you are a fan. I mean, there are a few interesting things going on here, like the organization of Xehanort trying to overtake the Disney worlds in more specific and logical ways so they can try beating Sora to the chase before he regains his strength, which in turn gives more reason than ever before for the Disney worlds to be here other than just nostalgia padding. They thought about how the worlds actually connect to the plot and I appreciate that. For instance, Davy Jones's heart being locked in a box yet him still being able to live and breathe is vitally important to what the organization is trying to do with their research on non-human replicas as vessels for hearts to place inside, which is also why the Toy Story world is important to them because, you know, they're sentient plastic. Anna's heart being thawed out by the power of true love after Elsa accidentally froze her would be very useful to the organization. And even Vanitas, a being comprised of nothing but negative energy, would thrive in the Monsters Inc. world with all of those negative emotions in the scream canisters. It's cool
cool to see the villains interact more with the worlds for what's inside them instead of just antagonising Sora, but there is still plenty of that, so don't worry. As far as the stilted cutscenes and awkward pauses go, I mean... That's a Kingdom Hearts staple by this point. I wasn't expecting The Last of Us or anything. It has been like that since the very first game, and I'm glad that they kept that choice in. It's not exactly good, I'm aware, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. And for the voice acting, I mean, it's not exactly as good as Denzel washing machine, but for Kingdom Hearts standards, it's just as cringy, cheesy, and on occasion, even as heartful and emotive as I was hoping for. For as silly as what's going on is on screen, the performances do the job splendidly. There's also a weird lack of Final Fantasy characters here, but honestly, I didn't really mind it. Firstly, because of how they all usually stayed in Hollow Bastion and Traverse Town in the previous games, which we never visit in this game. Well, you know, aside from Cloud and Sephiroth, but fuck off. And secondly, because 3 is definitely more focused on Sora, Donald, Goofy, Mickey, Riku, and the rest of the main Kingdom Hearts characters more than the the side characters. I'm personally glad that all the focus went into them after all we've developed over 38 games so far. That's an accurate number, don't look it up. I mean, I did love how the originals crossed over more with other franchises, but let's be real, in the grand scheme of things, they were just kind of there. Hey. Who are you? I'm Cloud. Who? From other video game. I see. Bye. Bye. I've got to say though, making this video without any kind of story spoilers is insanely difficult because everything the filler does build up to at the ending, Ow. It will mean everything to you if you've been following the story since 2002 and there is so much to gush about in the ending parts, it's indescribable. Just for some examples, without spoiling anything, those particle effects that come out of that one guy's weapon because of who was sacrificed to make it, that one part where certain characters use the PS4 controller in a special way after somebody gets lost in a certain place, all those final cutscenes of certain characters being in certain places as it all closes off. It's incredibly satisfying and that includes even the secret ending and the absolutely bombastic nonsense of the post credits scene. I mean... Yeah. To make it even better, do you want full-on confirmation that the team making these games are fully aware that it is completely stupid and it doesn't take itself as seriously as everybody thinks it does? This is the part where you spout some mumbo-jumbo and disappear, right? There you go. No fanfare? Let's play the game then. But before we sink our teeth into it, I need to pick what I desire, and that's easy. I desire Mickey! <laughs> is this who you are? No. That's Sora. Oh god, the excitement is already too much. Sora has pissed himself, everyone. Stop the game, stop the game. This wasn't a very good start for anybody, was it? So let's just kick off into the first Disney world and see if things improve. Hercules again. What is everyone's infatuation with that stuff? You know what, Hades? I really don't know. I can't count how many times we've been to this world and it's never that good whenever we go there. I'm with you here. <laughs> Well, I mean, I can say at least one thing in confidence this early on, that the visuals are bloody amazing, oh my god! The intro cinematic was incredible enough, but within the actual game itself, kick my prick, it's brilliant from the start and never lets up until the end. What you have here is the same level of depth and impeccable detail Fragmentary Passage had as a teaser for what 3 would be like, but with the same tech being refined and improved for the better in nearly every way. Most noticeably in how much smoother it is. Uh, okay, well, I can't lie, there is still a fair amount of stuttering in this game, and it can be pretty bad when new areas are loaded up and especially when there's lots of characters on the same screen, but overall it runs much smoother than what Fragmentary Passage was able to do with the same breathtaking magic attacks and particle effects, so I'm thrilled to see that they actually spent time on getting most of the kinks out with this new engine. On my ugly gorgeous limited edition Kingdom Hearts 3 PS4 Pro, a cute little bin. the game runs 90% of the time at 60 FPS with the stuttering never hampering the atmosphere for me much like with Bloodborne. It's not perfect, but it really does look too phenomenal for me to care that much. It's like a true 3D Disney movie come to life. It's whimsical, it's colorful, Colourful, and I'm sorry to sound cliche, but it's magical too. When I reached Twilight Town for the first time, heard that familiar, comforting, beautiful theme creep in, and then saw how much more was crammed in, even if it is just a side world, that was truly special to me. There is imagination brimming out of every possible corner of Kingdom Hearts 3, from environment effects to magical and final attack animations, that it almost hurts my head thinking about it. And not only are most of the worlds some of the best to explore in Kingdom Hearts, but are made that much more impressive by how good they look too. With lots of them featuring many contrasting themes and locations, within the same world with its own unique colour scheme and such to it, so it never feels like you're stuck in the same place. And as we start talking about the gameplay, well, Kingdom Hearts 3 leaves you in control of probably the most powerful character in all of the series so far. Kingdom Hearts 3 Sora can sometimes leave you totally overwhelmed and overpowered for all the shit he's able to pull off compared to the previous games. So before I say anything else, if you haven't played this game yet and you want to, Play it in proud mode. Because on a standard mode playthrough, I didn't find myself feeling that massively challenged. It's way too easy. And I get the feeling that this was done to be a little bit more accessible to the general public, but considering the story of 3, after all it's been building up to... 
That just seems ridiculous to me. But of course, you don't start off that powerful. That all gets unlocked as you play the game. But as we discussed, Sora starts the game with all of his strength and abilities lost from Dream Drop Distance. That's convenient, isn't it? And it's so serious that it makes Donald and Goofy go all twiddly fingers. Please stop doing that. I don't know where your fingers have been. This also, amazingly enough, leads Pete to have the only good idea he's ever had in any Kingdom Hearts game, and yet Maleficent doesn't take him up on it when they have the perfect chance to strike. I don't know about his sidekicks, but Kid Keyblader here looks way putier than the last time we saw him. <laughs> I say we finish him off while we still can. Waste no time with the boy, he's inconsequential. I mean, despite all of this, it doesn't stop Sora from being able to run directly up vertical walls, which he was never able to do before unless you count the cutscenes, but hey, I'm not about to argue with a game series that has these two in it. Who are different characters. Good luck, newbies! As far as the rest goes, though, well, if you've played Kingdom Hearts 1 or 2 specifically and really enjoyed them, you'll feel right at home here. You use the D-pad to cycle through your commands with magic, attack, and items, and spend a lot of your time locking onto enemies, whacking them with the hack and slash elements, and dodging around or guarding into counter-attacks where appropriate. This has all felt crunchy and satisfying to play since the very first game, and it hasn't changed at all for here. It just feels more fast and more expressive than it's ever done before. Most of the time, you're stuck with Donald Duck and Goofy, a mage and high defense character, respectively, who help you throughout many of the battles, are able to level up individually alongside you, and can be assigned their own weapons, items, and armor while you go through menus to decide how each element of their behavior can be used during the game, from offense, their own use of special attacks, to recovery of your own health and magic, or theirs. All with the same consumable items that you have to share throughout the game to stop you spamming healing constantly. The areas you explore feature big open spaces and cramped corridors alike, with many instances of much better and more responsive and less stiff platforming than 1 and 2 offer you, and the worlds beg you to explore every part of it high and low in order to find hidden treasure chests, speak to certain people, and complete various side quests, which breaks up the combat quite nicely. The movement in this game is identical to Fragmentary Passage, with that weird looking slide as you shift left and right, but honestly, I got used to it very quickly because of how slick and smooth the rest of the movement is in the game. If the terrain is steep enough, you'll automatically slide down it, you auto parkour up sparkling points of interest by hopping across pinpoint thin ledges, do the previously mentioned wall run vertically or horizontally to reach airborne enemies fast, or chain flashy attacks off of them, and after a steep enough drop, you can even air dive towards the floor, and if a target is waiting below you, a press of the button, and bingo slamingo, you explode into their stupid faces. Sora, after around a second or so, even goes into a much faster sprint compared to the other games to make getting around the levels, no matter how big, the least painful so far if there's a small part of the game with not much going on. Then you get the other stuff taken from elements of all the previous games, but thrown into here to make Sora as powerful as he's ever been. You can flow motion attacks similar to what Dream Drop Distance did with free running and such, allowing you to dodge into poles, hanging branches, walls, and even grindable rails in order to get around or link them into attacks against foes. But it's nowhere near as broken or exploitable in this game as it is in Dream Drop, even if you grab more equipable abilities to make it more useful. There aren't opportunities to use the flow motion literally everywhere around you, you can only really do a few set moves individually at a time, you can't link attacks onto walls onto attacks for what feels like forever, you can't fly around for years after a wall jump into another wall, and some enemy encounters don't even allow you to use the walls this way at all. But with the more restrictive nature of it, this makes you feel that that much better to tell a part of the level to piss off as you break the game and get through it early. Back on point though, you start off the game like any other Kingdom Hearts game, but while looking as magnificent as a renaissance oil painting, and while combat plays out as smooth as my legs. Okay, well not that one. You get more and more moves as you go throughout the Hercules world, so you're eased into everything you'll be able to mess with, which eventually ends up with you getting all the mechanics present in Fragmentary Passage, which in itself was a mix of classic Kingdom Hearts and Birth by Sleep. You get a charge bar for different Keyblade formation changes and final attacks depending on the type of magic or physical attacks you string together in order to change it, which also keeps in that lovely list of what's available for you and how long you have it for so you can best plan and utilize what to waste or cancel out in order to reach a really good attack later on. This, as I've said before, is a fantastic part of Birth by Sleep that keeps making combat swap around and change up to reward you for playing well, and the amount of different combos, abilities, and finishes you're able to pull off from these form changes with AoE attacks, or even something as simple as much more powerful powerful magic if you favoured spells over physicality are a little mind-boggling. The form transformation animations could be a little shorter, I suppose, for how often this happens, but on the plus side, this isn't just a cutscene and the transformation does attack enemies, so I don't mind it too much. Another thing taken from Birth by Sleep is the insanely cool shot lock attacks which behave similarly to the Dead Eye system in Red Dead Redemption, where you slow down time and have to lock on your cursor to as many targets as possible before you get hit yourself in order to fire projectiles or perform some kind of special move, and that in itself 
itself has its own charge bar that you can refill through items or successful fighting. The shot lock also allows you to quickly zip towards specific places of interest while in mid-jump to help out with platforming, exploration or enemy warping. And depending on the type of keyblade that you use, you get a new shot lock attack to play with, with some being much more useful than others. So the game makes you choose between the overall stats versus the bonus shot locks you'll get for each keyblade. Donald and Goofy themselves, along with any other Disney hero you meet in the world, have their own high damage finishing moves that can be activated under certain circumstances depending on how close you are to them and how well they have been able to keep the battle up without taking too many hits. But to keep you in control, you can either use them or ignore their cries while you sort out something else on the battlefield, but I personally use them whenever I could because, <laughs> I mean, Christ, look at them, they're so much fun. There's also the D-Link mechanic from Birth by Sleep, but behaves a little bit more like the combat style changes in Kingdom Hearts 2 mixed with the summons that are in Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. And for the cost of an entire magic bar, you can use a special Link attack from a Dream Eater, Wreck-It Ralph, Simba, the Little Mermaid, and Stitch for potential mountains of damage depending on the terrain and the situation. By the way, they also have their own finishing moves. And along with this, the magic spells themselves have seen a considerable buff compared to any other game so far, so you have the least amount of magic to play with, sticking mainly to just elemental spells, but that never became an issue for me, because I prefer assigning magic to my shortcut triggers and spamming spells up to four times in succession, or using them mid-combo, or even using them while slide dodging past enemies. It's a decent trade-off if you ask me. Along with the fact that magic can even be chained into other attacks like air spells allowing you to fly into the air and slam your keyblade down, or Blizzard leaving trails of ice that you can grind along for flow motion attacks off from them. The magic bar itself also has this clever mechanic of punishment for those going too trigger happy with it, because if you go over your limit that you have available, including use of your curing or link summon attacks, you're stuck in a cooldown charge period of not being able to use any magic at all until it refills or you use more ether to speed the process up. So keeping an eye on what you're doing is encouraged and satisfying to get good at, or even more interesting during combat if you've been relying on magic too much and then have to go full on counter, dodge and physical for a bit while it recharges. It's also a lovely touch how you can assign many different shortcut sets that you can swap between for your ideal loadout of links and elemental magic. Not something I ever did personally, but it's great to see that it's there. Speaking of swapping, you can even have multiple keyblades on you at once that you can switch between on the fly, not only for moments where you feel like you need more powerful magic or physical strength, but also for the sake of their own unique shot lock attacks, charge meter formation changes in finishing moves, and also their their own unique uses of the same magic spells you already have but while in those different formation changes. This is all okay though because to pull you back in a little bit you do have a few costs for form changes such as with the Monsters Inc Keyblade form change not allowing you to guard while you're using it, the Toy Story one giving you great range and damage but a high stagger if you get touched, and the special rage form while you're low on health giving you more power at the cost of your own health, along with less control of where you actually are in the game world while you perform combos. Are you a little worried that keeping older Keyblades won't work in the long term as the game gets harder though? Well, have no fear because it's possible to go to the Moogle shops and actually upgrade all your current Keyblades so they're stronger in strength and magic for later game areas, allowing you to enjoy the special moves or designs of some of your favourite Keyblades instead of just leaving them behind when you unlock the next one and giving you more reason to swap around with them during fights. The Kingdom Hearts 2 AP system is back in terms of how ridiculous the amount of customizable abilities there are to unlock and that can be swapped around and unequipped based on how many points you have available. There's counter strikes and counter dodges to slide underneath threats combo pluses, aerial recoveries and counters, different mid-combo rises and ground pounds. It's off the charts experimental and really fun to mess around with. They even got my favourite Pixar character Remy involved with how you can find ingredients in the world. <laughs> and then take them to him so you can cook up recipes with WarioWare styled micro games, of which the better or more accurate you are rewards you with better food, which you can then prepare into a starter, main course and dessert meal that will provide you with temporary stat bonuses for about half an hour. This is a brilliant feature, totally adorable and breaks up the gameplay just that little bit more when the alternative could have just had the meal be automatically made, which is kind of boring in comparison. It also creates a tiny bit more tension if you find a particularly rare ingredient or you can cook a food that you haven't cooked before, and there's always that chance that you're going to mess the micro game up and lose the ingredient and lose the chance to make the food you haven't made yet. I mean, it's not massive or anything, but it still makes the food a little bit more important than it would be otherwise. Peppered with all of this stuff are also the mini games hidden in every world that all play out totally differently and provide you with big, small, permanent or consumable bonuses alike, altogether giving you the most amount of Kingdom Hearts gameplay variety you could ever have wished for in the whole series, but like I said, at the expense of it being a bit too easy unless your difficulty is on proud mode. This is Valerian Steel. Remember No Man's Sky? 
Didn't it suck? Well, how about we have a new version of No Man's Sky, but with actual stuff to do, reasons for things to exist, variety to encounters, and with all of this existing within a tiny side game within a bigger action RPG? I hope you'd like that, because that's what the gummy ship segments are like. Fair enough, you can't land on any planet or rock you want to, and it isn't that deep, all things considered, but despite all of that, it's still more fun than vanilla No Man's Sky when it first came out, and you can completely ignore all of it if you want to. For just a simple method of reaching each different Disney world, at least, there's a lot going on here. I'm not sure if I prefer this over Kingdom Hearts 2's varied and seizure-inducing arcade shooting segments, but I do think it's taking steps in the right directions by making your gummy ship an actual tangible thing floating through space, exploring the systems, battling waves of enemies and finding treasure. This here is way more explorative than I could have ever expected. You find new ship parts and upgrades hidden away in meteors, use air currents and speed pads to get around quickly, follow breadcrumbs of power-ups and ship parts that lead you to unlockable warp points, crystal for rare ship blueprints, and even extra optional boss encounters that are just there out in the middle of the world. And you even find these really cool treasure orbs that are very easy to unlock, give you a lot of stuff, and I really hope are a reference to Treasure Planet, because that is a highly underrated Disney movie and will be badass as hell to include in any other Kingdom Hearts game, <coughs> just say it. And then you have the battle system, where you see how high the difficulty of the fight will be before flying into clusters of enemy ships, and then take them all on with equipable special weapons and unlockable tiny ships alongside you, basically giving you the best of both worlds if you prefer to explore but also loved the fast-paced speed racer battles that Kingdom Hearts 2 had to offer. I spent way more time in this part of the game than I'd care to admit, just wandering around and seeing what I could find. It harkens back a lot to Wind Waker, actually, but in space. And if you aren't a fan of it, that's no issue, because you can still set a marker for your next world, use a fast travel point, and go straight there while ignoring everything else around you. And even that is more visually engaging and exciting with manoeuvring around lasers and obstacles than what Kingdom Hearts 1 gummy ships allowed you to do. Granted, it could have a little bit more variety in backdrops, music, and enemy types were the two inspired fast paced bullet hell stuff, but with everything else going on, I'm personally not that fussed, especially if you aren't one to bother going into the incredibly deep creation tool to install new weapons, armor and agility panels that now even allows you to use materials and textures to decorate blocks instead of just colors. My ship was made of crystals, and I called it the Cat Storm. Because I'm seven. Okay, so I just got to my next world and this loading screen popped up and I've got to say I'm, I'm rather confused. It has a main image and a profile pic and, and a hash, hashtags? Is this Instagram? Yeah, so in this game, Sora has a goddamn smartphone, the spoilt little bugger, and because of that, he's able to do all sorts of things with it. Most importantly, though, take pictures and selfies, with the introduction to this mechanic being pretty entertaining. <laughs> Intra. Duction. Intra Donald should. Why do I have to do it? Hey, tough luck. You drew the short straw. It's okay. Oh, I'm sitting out of the photo with you, Donald. This isn't just a cute little detail either, there's side quests to complete with them, most notably the Moogle Shop owner's photo missions that give you lots of bonuses for taking snaps in the middle of combat or during your many treasure hunts around the world. And even cooler, the Hidden Mickey emblems, which is basically what would happen if the Hidden Mickey challenge at Disneyland was put into a video game and gave you a secret ending to your own life for finding enough of them. Oh, and you get other handy benefits for finding them, like... Jewelry. Even cooler, these Mickey emblems are often devilishly hidden within the environment and not always just planted obviously on things, rewarding the very observant and giving you yet another thing to do while exploring the gorgeous Disney worlds. And there's lots of other great details too. Not just that Riku's keyblade looks more like a modern car key than a traditional door key, but even with more slight additions to gameplay. The most noticeable to me were the brand new attraction attacks based on Disneyland rides. These not only look spectacular and give me warm tingly memories of riding these rides at Disney theme parks, but also provide incredible uses against large groups of enemies and reward you for paying attention to the enemies since you have to hit the ones with green circles to activate them. The green circle itself is timed so you're left to wonder if it's worth going after that single enemy at the risk of leaving yourself open, and if you accidentally activate one and had some of the finishes you were wanting to use, you can always just cancel it. You can even skip the intro sequences for the special attacks if you find them too repetitive and want to use them a lot. And if you thought that fighting an army in Kingdom Hearts 2 was the ultimate bad mofo thing you could do in all of Kingdom Hearts, well in Kingdom Hearts Three, you can fight an army of heartless and nobodies at the same time in a similar fashion, followed by bombing them all while riding Thunder Mountain and watching them erupt to the sky like you're punching a bowl of Maltesers. <laughs>
There are a lot more contextual attacks to do during combat too, like cover shooting when an enemy has fast firing projectiles, and status effects like being burned don't just stagger you, but physically mess you around as punishment for not being careful enough. When you use certain Donald and Goofy team finishing moves while locked onto specific enemies, you can take advantage of new attacks that can often one hit kill the enemy that you're locked onto. Along with this, there are new Trinity moves that instead of just being a symbol you activate to find more secrets like in Kingdom Hearts 1, actually give you new ways to explore, move around faster, and generally just be more adorable. And hey, do you want another drinking game? Take a shot whenever something in the game happens and you say out loud to yourself, this is so cool. All of those ridiculous antics from 1 and 2 are here, but with the new speed of the gameplay, wall running, flashy attacks, towering bosses and bursting levels of joyous special attacks, you're essentially playing through the stuff that you would have only ever watched in 2 with contextual button actions, and that feels great. And the bosses themselves are made majorly impressive because of this. If they aren't hitting you with attacks just as flashy as yours, then they're teaming up in groups to give you more to deal with. And I will admit, there is a sad lack of Disney villain boss battles to be sure, but honestly, like the lack of Final Fantasy side characters, I wasn't too bummed out by that either. I prefer having to stop nothing but the Heartless and Nobodies for the sake of the final battle the game is building up to, with the occasional Disney boss battle thrown in for good measure. And if you want another drinking game, take a shot whenever Donald says something that you can understand. You'll be fine. Because you never can! <laughs> Thank God for the subtitles and the cutscenes, because during the combat I seriously can't make out a single thing he says. I can't tell if I should reply to Donald or give him CPR. <laughs> Are you choking, Donald, or are you in the middle of a giant sneeze? And who the hell made Goofy the voice of reason in this story? May your heart be your guiding key. Have you listened to him recently? Oh, he's with them. <laughs> yep. He sounds like a blocked up sink. Is anyone there? Hey, hmm? I hear a voice. No, you don't say. It's like one of those spot the differences puzzles. Except really easy. I'm sorry that I was being so stubborn. Please forgive me. No. Anyway, I think it's about time that I talk about the worlds in this game individually and how I felt about them. And I gotta be honest, I was a little bit apprehensive to start with because Kingdom Hearts 2 did rely a lot on empty, flat spaces. But in Kingdom Hearts 3, I'm glad to say that even if there's a slightly bigger world than another one or there's slightly less content in it compared to another one, they are all still a joy to explore. As a whole, these worlds are the biggest and most explorable in the series so far and offer tons of platforming, completely optional and missable combat encounters to level up or find treasure and equipment, and even if there's not much going on in one world in comparison to another, there's still always something to find, something to smash up, some kind of ingredients to find for cooking. <laughs> And even some kind of Mickey emblem, there's always something worthwhile to find, whether big or small. For Olympus, well, yeah, we may be going back there yet again for the eighth time so far, but I'm at least happy to say this is, in my opinion, the best incarnation of the Hercules world so far. Mainly because it's mostly being destroyed, but also because it's a great teaching tool and very rewarding to go through as you unlock all the permanent moves Sora will use for the rest of the game. For as repetitive as it is, I would have loved to see the Colosseum Cup games from Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 come back, just for the sake of it, whether it's in Olympus or it's in the Underworld. I I thought that was a really cool addition, but nah, eh, what can you do? With everything else, it's absolutely huge and insanely varied compared to the stale, boring Colosseum aesthetics we've seen countless times, and the amount of optional branching paths and explorable locations is off the chart. The weather effects are a sight to behold too, and it's overall a very impressive way to kick off the adventure. There's even a few shortcuts to break in order to make exploration a little easier, or even statues to knock down to find secret treasure chests, and it's all capped off with a marvel of a boss battle that's nice and easy, yet a feast for the eyes. Hercules. Son of Zeus, demigod of strength and stamina, not strong enough for knee-deep water. Donald, for Christ's sake, you're a duck! This shouldn't be hard for you! <laughs> Off to Twilight Town then, and well, I've already complimented the visuals here. They're bootyful, but it's also a nice smaller area for practicing some of the flow motion attacks on tree branches. This is also where you meet Remy and have to rescue him! Oh! And wow, holy shit, unlike previous games, the town is actually populated this time. You'd think this was a town or something. I'm not sure about the residents themselves, though. They're a little bit too weird for me, and they like to hang around. And you keep veal beef inside boxes of popcorn!
Toy Box. Well, I mean, come on. Woody and Buzz are talking about the heartless and nobodies. Who needs Toy Story 4 with this around? And for the rest of the world, it's a little bit more wide open and blocky than some of the other worlds, but I still massively enjoyed it for all the variety of it being set in a multi-story mall. The amount of options for combat are high too, with the exclusive mech toys in this world, with many of them having different special attacks that can be hijacked by you or enemies on the fly to keep things moving at a nice, exciting pace. And the vast amount of flat surfaces and shells to free run around make combat that little bit more enjoyable for flying enemies. Being toy-sized and being able to fit through vents and stuff is pretty fun, and not to mention, the missions in this world involve you actually having to listen to the characters and look around for abnormalities in the toy shops instead of just walking around to random areas to trigger cutscenes. And to be honest, the animations of the dinosaur toys that get possessed are enough to make this game a 10 out of 10 in my eyes. There's even a little rock and sock and minigame to unlock a treasure chest, and in the best part of the whole world, Woody steps up and outright tells Xehanort to piss off. Darkness is the heart's true nature. Whatever you're talking about, I don't care. Put Buzz back the way he was, then get lost. Whoa, someone needs to call the cannibals because that was savage. Corona from Tangled, well aside from it being a beer, it's easily the best looking Disney World in the game and not just for the luscious greenery and colour contrasting. You get to see fire spells scorch the grass, ice attacks form across ponds and the use of sunlight and shadows is truly wonderful. Rapunzel using her own hair for attacks and holding it in a bunch as she runs around behind you is adorable. And what about this bloody dancing mini game eh? I won't lie when I say I had the goofiest smile on my face during this whole part. Well, uh, wait no, I don't mean actual goofy smile, no be because that's sickening. But I mean, it's hard not to look like that during this part. Look at Sora go! It's not difficult, it's not even that great taking a step back, but would I rather have this over any of the Kingdom Hearts 2 Little Mermaid toss? A musical for everyone to have a lot of finny fun. Yes. And that's saying a lot since this is only a five minute diversion instead of the point of the entire world. And we're heartless experts. Yeah, yeah! I also wanted to share with you this epic boss ending I was able to pull off with an aerial dive. There's no reason for this, I just was very proud that I captured it for this video and I think it looks badass as hell. Fight me. Thanks! Take this! Monstropolis. Well, firstly, Mike Wazowski looks more or less exactly as he does from Monsters Inc. in terms of body animations and the texture of his skin. It's actually quite frightening how close we're getting to big budget 3D animation within interactive mediums. It's just a shame I can't say the same for the voice acting of Randall, though. I'm numero uno, top of the leaderboard, baby. That's perhaps the worst impression of him I've ever heard. This world is one of the more linear in the whole game, with the battle arenas connecting to mostly straightforward corridors, but that doesn't mean it isn't fun, because it still is. Plus, it's quite explosive and kinetic for being mostly set in a factory. That gloop boss thing was the first time in standard mode where I actually found myself a little bit challenged as well. It's quite hard to read its attacks, it uses multiple arms to harm you with their own health bars, and the abilities it has can lock you into combos based on where you're standing. I have to pay attention to my surroundings quite a bit here, and I appreciate that. Also, am I the only one here that found Mike and Sully getting rid of Vanitas the funniest shit ever? Right in the middle of one of his monologues, they grab him, throw him into a door, grab that door and throw that into another door, grab that door and throw it into another door, grab that door and throw it into another door, and then shred it to pieces all in the space of a few seconds. Whoever wrote that bit in, have a drink on me. That was brilliant. Take a shot whenever- Deep in the hundred acre wood where Eeyore and Owl are dead. Yeah, seriously, there's no Eeyore or Owl in this world, which is already a minus in my books, but does this world save itself in any other areas? Well, it's as lovely, bubbly, cuddly, and disgustingly cute as ever, but with it being an optional minigame world like with other Kingdom Hearts games, the minigames on offer in this world are sadly the worst in the entire series for me. It's just the same thing, copied and pasted multiple times over for no no reason, and you're stuck to exploring Rabbit's house only. What the hell happened here? Look at the stuff you can do in Kingdom Hearts 2 when you're going through the Book of Pooh, ripping up all of the paragraphs. That, that This is cool! Why couldn't we have anything like this again? The 100 Acre Wood minigame in Kingdom Hearts 3 is basically Buster Move, which is fine enough on its own, but repeated over and over again with little to no changes. That's just lame, Square Enix. I don't know why this world was even here with how bad this all was. If I wanted to play Blossom Blast, I'd just play Blossom Blast. But the problem is I don't want to play Blossom and blast in the first place because Blossom Blast bloody blows! Yeah. 
delicious. That's how we do it in my garden. And all of this just so we can discover that human feces has a heart. Made me vanish from Pooh's heart. Perfect. Arendelle from Frozen. My god, look at our footprints in the snow. This is amazing. This is amazing. For me, this was the part of the game where my teammates actually started dying on me, making this a pretty engaging area in terms of combat. Enemies were hitting harder, and Remy's meals really ended up helping me here. Aside from this, well, you can roll snowballs around into enemies for quick kills and satisfying XP grinding, but the sad thing is that with most of it taking place on a snowy mountaintop, there's so much of the same kinds of colours here, making it one of the more unremarkable areas to explore for me. It's still fun though, don't get me wrong, and still chock full of detail with very creative enemies, but in comparison to other worlds, it feels a little bit more one note with how it's designed and looks. What doesn't help it is the theme of the world being a constant climb up to the top of the mountain, only to then be thrown back down again, which only succeeds in making the act of exploring the mountain feel more repetitive than it actually is. And here, you can be completely honest with your good old daddy caddy. Are you sick of let it go at this point? Well, tough shit! Because the whole song ripped straight from the movie is in this game, but there's a twist that makes it all worth it to me. Sora, Donald and Goofy were there the entire time during that scene and even interrupt the singing. That's Elsa's voice! Personally, I can't stand the song, but I mean, I would be stupid to not expect this kind of thing to happen, especially in Kingdom Hearts, and that small twist of the game existing alongside the film for a second was pretty funny. Don't forget, it's still a lot better than- yeah, that's just did you also think that Hans couldn't be any more evil? Well, now he can create black holes from goop that comes out of his butt and then he turns into this. Sure, why not? I also totally missed the middle section of Olaf's body while I was rebuilding him and so had no choice but to fail the mission the first time over and I made one of my least favourite Disney characters look like this, which was worth any hardships this level gave me tenfold. See? I told you! A walking, talking snowman! <laughs> Here we are at the Caribbean with pirates in it. That's the, that's the name of the film, isn't it? And wow, Mike Wazowski's character model was cool enough, but this whole world is a visual marvel. It's insane how far we've come since Kingdom Hearts 2. I would have been totally okay with the whole game taking this realistic, gritty, rough textured approach personally. It looks so detailed and fits the style of cartoonier characters pretty naturally. For the rest of it though, well, for me, this was the best world in the game by far. After you do all the wishy-washy linear stuff and a bit of exploring around the world for items in a main quest, you are then able to freely explore the high seas in your very own pirate ship as you swim around and dive anywhere you'd like, go to any island, any settlement or hidden cave that you can find to plunder some of the rarest items in the game, find hundreds of crabs to upgrade your ship's health and weapons, don't ask, and prepare yourself for the final battle in a giant whirlpool of Lovecraftian abominations. This was a great world. The underwater sections are easily the best in the series too and handle combat the most elegantly. It controls really good, you can use most of your ground abilities like guarding and dodging along with your magic, and deep dive exploring all of the different caverns and shipwrecks isn't only great fun for the level design, but rewarding too, especially with no air meter to worry about and the choice to propel your way through nice and fast to keep everything quick and slick and neck and stick. The sailing parts themselves are basically a slightly more stripped down version of Assassin's Creed 3's navy battles, but much easier to control and infinitely more hilarious with all the different special moves you can use after you connect cannon fire enough times without taking damage by guarding at the correct moments. I mean, look at this. Look at this. You can't tell me that this isn't the best ship combat you've ever ever seen in a video game. There isn't any sign of the classic he's a pirate theme, and that is a slight downer I guess, but then I remember how great it feels to connect a cannonball hit with some flammable gases to sink ships near instantly, and I forget all about it. This world totally rocks, and I easily spent the most time getting lost in here. Yo, ho, yo, ho, pirates like for me. I also suspect there's a running theme in this game of all the Disney inhabitants just not giving a single crap about what the bad guys want to do and not letting them get away with it. I mean, you've got Woody confronting Xehanort, Mike and Sully getting rid of Vanitas for the time being. And now we have Jack Sparrow doing this. <sighs> Take a shot! Finally, we have San Francisco from Big Hero 6. A solid world and a decent way to end things, but not one of the strongest worlds in the game, in my opinion. It's a little bit too big for its own good, and aside from the extremely fun ring-chasing minigame, there isn't much else to do in terms of mission content or anything like that. But what makes this much better is the fact there are so many secrets to find hiding away in alleyways and rooftops, enemy encounters to run into, buildings to run up, rails to grind along, and tying it all together are the story missions mostly being just one big explosive and epic encounter after 
another in true superhero crime fighting fashion. There's even a mission where you've got to save all of your friends under the clock because they're being beaten up by the main threat of the world. And the visuals, well, I mean, I was kind of hypnotized a lot of the time, I've got to be honest. I'm also sad to say the world is a little bit too short as well compared to the others, but I mean, it's Baymax, so I can't find myself disliking it at all, really. Sharing photographs can be a positive bonding experience. That's as far as I want to go in this video, though, because the rest of it is just major spoiler territory and I don't want to ruin anything for you. So, overall, what did I think of Kingdom Hearts 3? Well, whoa. I don't think I can say it's my favourite instalment of Kingdom Hearts, but I can say that I enjoyed it nearly as much as Kingdom Hearts 2. It is so, so close. In different ways, of course. It's an incredible achievement in many ways, but in one or two places, there are some really stick-out, iffy design choices, and that's a problem because how long have they been doing these games now? And you would have thought that the refined formula would be just even more refined. I wouldn't have expected any kind of small step back, no matter how small it is. I mean, that's not even including the fact that there isn't anywhere near as much post-game and additional content as Kingdom Hearts 2 even. And that's probably the biggest point of contempt for a lot of people. But like I said, I think it succeeds in way too many other ways for me to even consider it being a step down. It's far from it, in my opinion. I don't think it's the best one overall, but I wasn't disappointed with it. Let's just leave it at that. The thing that really resonated with me about Kingdom Hearts 3 at the end of the day, though, is how much love was clearly poured into every crevice of it. The beginning moments have unique animations for Sora identical to his Kingdom Hearts 1 model just for the sake of playing as him for 10 seconds. Using the camera with your friends gets them reacting in many different ways. Make sure you get my good side. Right. There's even hidden QR code minigames that you can unlock and play on your phone wherever you are that are not only important to end game content, but are just cool on their own since they deliberately decided to take a clunky game and watch approach to all of them when they could have easily looked and felt like every other part of the game and come across as completely redundant. And I won't lie, they also control really well and are quite addictive. Even things as sweet and simple as party members talking to you way more than they ever did in one or two makes the game feel like a well-crafted labour of love, with more optional humorous dialogue happening depending on what you do. Oh, hey, what happened to my voice? What? <clears throat> well, this is rather embarrassing. Get a load of me, Buzz. I sound like an alien. Count your eyes. And things as subtle and insignificant as Remy looking depressed when you say you don't want to go into the bistro. Any other game in the series would probably have just had Remy as a static NPC with a text bubble that just cuts back to the game if you choose not to go in. But here, no. Oh, look at the sweet little face. No, stop. Stop, Remy. Stop. That's enough. Don't be sad. I'll come in and I'll cook overtime for you, baby. Whoa. Oh. Hey, that's not related. Sora not being able to count his cannon. In the end though, well, we started this video with a fanfare, so it seems only fitting to end with one. Are you ready, everybody? My lord, it feels good to be out of that hair gel. Don't know about you guys, I hate stuff like that in my I don't do products, I just hate it. But anyway, thank you so much for watching till the very end of this video, everybody. Do you want to see some outtakes from today's video? Stay tuned, they're at the very end of this video, so just want to go through a few things before we get there. First of all, I want to thank you all so, so much for staying until the very end of this review that I did for you today. My god, this was a massive video, and that means more to me than you can even imagine. I mean at the risk of sounding a little bit pukey and cliche, especially with Kingdom Hearts being the subject, it touches my heart. Seriously, it, it does. It, it it means that I'm doing something right, because if I can keep you engaged for this long and you enjoy it and I can get a laugh out of you or whatever, that really, really does mean buckets upon buckets to me. Seriously, I thank you so much. And thank you once again to everybody who has supported me via Patreon for last month. All of these people on the screen right now have gone to the description below to my Patreon page and pledged um, a certain amount to appear in the credits. Thank you so much. All of these amazing people that have helped keep the show running, especially when you've got to wait a little bit longer for massive videos like this. And special, special thanks to the top tier supporters for last month. Omama2, Basil, Carl Hakkinen, Gamer Man, I Have a Portal Gun, Exopaz, Matthew Hubble, Chris Slattery, Mills Kahai, Brandon Brandon, Binary Code, Kirsten B, Cyberpunk Symphony, Nicole Gennaro, Dave Marshall, Nathan Young, Victor Patrick Bauer, Robert Alamsha, The Game Shed, Daniel Leon, Mitchell Reed, A.D. Thornton Smith, and Maximilian Ely. Thank you so much, every single one of you amazing people. In fact, the most recent chapter in the Kingdom Hearts story was only released. Roz? Re! <laughs> Me! <laughs> Uh, 
everything at once. Everything I get an email and the dog decides to snort. You <laughs> like a little old man. This is awful. Oh honey, there's a ledge. What am I gonna do? I don't know. Go on. No, don't jump. That's I'm not a bad jumping, idea. I'm not jumping. Oh, Ow. One day I lost my ass. <laughs> Did you? But then I got it. <laughs> Get away from me. Huh? <laughs> oh, <laughs> they're stuck on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> what? My shoes are stuck! Oh no! Oh no! My shoes are stuck in the boxes! <laughs> uh, bye! Oh, I'm, oh, I'm soaking! Bye! Oh, no, go on! I can't get my shoe out! Oh no, my shoe! <laughs>